and being so bowed. May I just remind you of two things. The possibility, at least the possibility, that the Lord may be speaking in this place tonight. If our prayers are answered, it will be so. And if it should be so, we have accepted a solemn responsibility in allowing ourselves to hear the Lord speak. Maybe a very blessed thing to have the Lord speak, but it is a very responsible thing. For we can never be the same before the Lord, should he speak. And we together, Lord, have said, speak. Speak, Lord, in the stillness, while I wait on thee. Give us, then, hearts that are truly touched with the precious blood of Jesus, minds that are guarded, and grace that we may receive and obey. We ask in the name of the Lord Jesus. As there are quite a few who have joined us since last evening, it might be helpful if I were just to hurriedly review the course that we have been following in these evening hours under the general title the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our object has been to see how the cross is presented to us in the letters of the Apostle Paul. And what each letter sets forth as a particular application and meaning of the cross. With the letter to the Romans, we began noting how comprehensive and all-inclusive the cross is. And then out of the all-inclusiveness, we began the second place, the breakup, so to speak, and the application to particular and peculiar situations and needs, the first of which in, was in the first letter to the Corinthians. And we notice that in that letter, there is a great divide made. The divide between the situation and the condition of the Corinthians as they were when Paul wrote and the situation and condition to which he sought to bring them by way of the cross, repeatedly emphasizing that the cross was the way of transition from the one to the other 
and we headed that consideration with the two humanities. Even where Christians are concerned, that type of Christian which Paul describes as the natural man, which literally, in his own language, was and is the man of soul, the soulical man, the type living wholly upon the basis of the soul. And then, on the other side, the other kind, of humanity, the spiritual man, man of spirit, and governed by the spirit. The letter falls apart into those two categories, the two humanities within the compass, mark you, of the Christian community. And we saw what a difference there is between the two, even as Christians, and how the cross cuts clean in there to make the division between soul and spirit. I'm going to say for just a few extra words in that particular connection. You must remember that with the Apostle Paul, being the man that he was, with his very thorough Jewish training and knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, there would always be that background to his mentality. The Holy Spirit would be taking of that background and although perhaps not quoting always the Old Testament or referring to any particular book in the Old Testament, it is there all the time. If you look beneath the surface, you will find it. And in this particular connection, which we are thinking now, it is so evident that there is a background of that kind to what the Apostle wrote in the first letter to the Corinthians. Here in this letter, he brings into view that phase of Israel's history which was in the wilderness and its tragic issue in chapter 10 of the first letter he brings that forward as a warning to the Corinthians remember it he speaks about their failure and falling in the wilderness after having come out of Egypt, after having been redeemed with precious blood. This is not my interpretation, this is exactly what Paul said. They fell in the wilderness. They died in the wilderness. They did not go through to that for which God brought them out. And I say again, he used it as a very solemn warning to the Corinthians and says, in effect, be careful, you are now in exactly the same position that Israel was in at that time. And I'm warning you that your destiny can be the same as theirs. You may fail to go through to what God has called you unto, you may, using his own word, perish in the wilderness. 
I know that will raise some questions in your mind, and I expect you would want to ask me those questions if you had the opportunity, if I gave you the chance about final perseverance and being one saved and lost and all that. But don't forget we are not talking about salvation. That is settled with the Corinthians. We're talking about inheritance the purpose of salvation. And Paul will make it very clear that you may be on the foundation. He's saying it here in chapter 3. You may be on the, salvation, on the foundation which is Christ, but when you are on the foundation, you may put up a superstructure which will be entirely lost with all your life work go up in smoke. And that's only another way of interpreting Israel in the wilderness. Now then, what was it that lay at the root of that tragedy of Israel? And you have the answer in the fourth chapter of the letter to the Hebrews. Now you know, men have struggled all through the centuries to get Paul out of the letter to the Hebrews. We're not going to argue about the authorship, but... There's something here that is very similar, if not identical, in the 10th chapter of the first letter to the Corinthians and the 4th chapter of the letter to the Hebrews. You notice in that 4th chapter, the writer, whoever he was, the writer is speaking about this very same thing. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And he enlarges upon the tragedy of Israel perishing in the wilderness and not going in to possess. And then he uses that conjunction to which I drew your attention the other evening without enlarging upon it as I am now. For for they entered not in because of unbelief, they perished in the wilderness. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing to the dividing of thunder of foes and spirit. There are your two categories again. Through humanity, the soul people perished in the wilderness. Spiritual people, which were raised up, went over and went through. Very impressive, isn't it? That little four, that mighty little four. The word of God divides between soul and spirit. The implication of the actual statement is, so that's the cause of all the trouble in the wilderness. If you remember the history of those those years, those decades in the wilderness, oh, how much so. The soul was always this, what am I getting out of this? How do I benefit by this? I, in Corinth, every one of you said I. What am I getting out of it? Spiritual, and you remember the change over the transition with Joshua, if the Lord delight in us, then he will be with him. Oh, it's the Lord's delight, not mine, the difference between soul and spirit. I doubt. Are we going to come on that very definitely as we come into the letter to the Galatians? Present. I want you to notice. That is the big issue amongst the people of God, redeemed by precious blood, brought out of the world and bondage to Satan, and yet and yet failing to go right through to the purpose of that redemption and all that God meant. And the cross comes in to save us from falling in the wilderness by the way and missing the inheritance by 
acting like a two-edged sword, dividing asunder between soul and spirit. That's the cross in First Corinthians. And then we saw afterwards, last night, that when that issue is fundamentally settled, because these issues are not settled all at once, you know, they're only fundamentally settled, but a lot yet to be done, and we'll find a lot more in Second Corinthians to be done in that connection, but the root has been cut. The act has been applied to the root. Something has been done. You look at the seventh chapter, of the second letter to the Corinthians, you hear the apostle speaking about what happened after they got his first letter. Oh, what, what humiliation. Oh, what tears. Oh, what sorrow. That are broken people. They were not broken before. Now that are broken people, they are weeping and they are sobbing over what had happened. I say the axe had been planted at the root and something fundamental had been done. And therefore, they can come over Jordan, so to speak, come over or get through and start on new ground, altogether the ground of the open heaven, the ground of the unveiled faith. Remember? The unveiled faith. When he shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit is Lord, there is liberty. You're over on the other side. There's a different atmosphere, isn't there, in the second letter to the Corinthians from the first? Quite a different atmosphere, and it seems now that there are possibilities. And so they come into the good of the unveiled face, which in other words, used by the apostle, is God who said, let light shine in darkness, has shined into our hearts. Give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Can't say that in letter number one, but you can say it in number two. Wherefore, having this ministry, the ministry of the unveiled faith. I'm not going over all that we covered in a full hour last night. But the point is, they are now represented in their spiritual position, and you're noticing the spiritual sequence of these letter, letters, aren't you? In spiritual sequence, there's a move forward. The new prospect and possibility. New potentiality. A new testament, a new atmosphere. So when the people got over Jordan, that's how it was. You breathe more freely. While you're reading the first letter to the Corinthians, especially those early chapters, you're not breathing freely at all. Not at all. But now the atmosphere is clearer and freer, and as a move forward, and it is a great move forward, they are over. And, as I have said, something fundamental, though not final, has been done. It's been done. Jericho, the inclusive thing, because, you know, Jericho did represent in it sevenfoldness, the seven nations that were, were to be conquered. Seven is the dominant number there of Jericho, that is spiritual fullness or spiritual inclusiveness. When you've got Jericho, you have in figure and in spirit and in spiritual position, you've got the land, you've got everything. That is, in the sovereign will of God. So, being over into the second letter to the Corinthians, you are over and you have compassed Jericho, that is the foundation, is dealt with. Now what? And now what? 
Yes. Not now. Soul or soulical people, but spiritual people. You do not need me to go back to you to the beginning of the book of Joshua. The man standing with the drawn sword, captain of the host of the Lord, into which Joshua capitulated the campaign. Well, you don't need me to tell you that that is the representation of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit taking charge of the campaign. Well, leave all these details. This is where we are in the second letter. Everything looks wonderfully promising, doesn't it? New atmosphere, new prospects, and new potentialities. What makes what next? AI. Galatians. A hold up. Arrested progress. Brought to a standstill. A reverse. A stepping back onto the old ground. The whole thing is in jeopardy. That's Galatians, isn't it? Oh, these, these cries of the apostle. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has cast the spell over you, the witch's spell over you? You were running well. You had come to Jericho. What has happened to you? And all the rest. That's Galatians. AI. Old ground. What our brother Watchman Lee, when he was with us, used to call the earth touch. Fatal earth touch. Going back into the old ground of death. The apostle in this letter to the Galatians puts it in, strangely enough, in two, two words or a phrase. The word. The word. You know how he finishes the letter to the Galatians. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, whereby the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. And he links that very phrase, or that very phrase is linked in the spiritual sequence of things with this AI business. Of course, we know what Achan did, the AI, the Babylonish garment and the wedge of gold. Touch of the earth, touch of the world, you see, the world system. You touch that. Even God cannot deliver you from the prince of this world. You take full advantage of every contact that you make with this world to arrest your spiritual progress. Does that? Paul calls it the world. We shall see what that meant as we go on. For well, it's a very comprehensive and inclusive thing again. It was the arresting hand of something. Leave the book of Joshua for a moment and come to this letter to the Galatians. What was this arresting hand, this hell that brought this beautiful movement to a standstill, caused rather a revert than a going on? What was it? Oh, of course, you say, you've told us. Getting back onto soul ground again, yes, all right. But what is that? What is that? Dear friends, if you look again at this letter to the Galatians, which you know so well, you'll find it is in a little suffix, an ism, an ism. 
In this case, Judaism. Judaism. That was it. That was it. And tonight, in this connection of Galatians, I'm speaking about the battle for sonship. The battle for sonship. Remember the three major words in this letter? Liberty, spirit with a capital S, son. I'll come back to that. Battle for sonship. And the battle for sonship raged around or on the ground of an ism. And it was that ism that brought the Galatian Christians to this standstill, to this arrested progress, and called out this terrible heart cry from the apostles. Terrible heart cry, my little children, for whom I am again in traveling till Christ to be fully formed in you. The pity they, the translators, have given us the whole word, just put, till Christ be formed in you. No, till Christ be fully formed in you. That's the issue. Was the beginning of the formation of Christ arrested? The full formation of Christ sunset as come under a curse. And all because of an ism, a mighty ism, was Judaism. I need not, I think, spend any time in explaining and defining Judaism. You've read the letter. Trust that you've read it before this meeting. What Judaism is. What we're going to say will perhaps define it best as we enlarge this thing with what I'm saying. It was an ism. An ism that did it. You noting that? You really got a hold of that? An ism did it all. Spoils it all. And isms always have the same effect. They always do. Isms. Recently I came across something written by a very well known Christian leader and teacher man who over half a century ago wrote standard lives of Christ and the Apostle and the Apostle Paul were the great vogue at that time. Don't hear so much about them today. He wrote this. Allow me to read it to you because it's so closely related to what we say in the craft and subtlety of the devil and man, Christianity has ever tended to wither away into Judaism, into rabbinism, into scholasticism, into ecclesiasticism, into Romanism, into sectarianism, into dead schemes of dogmatic belief, into dead routines of elaborate ceremonial, into dead exclusiveness of party and party narrowness, into dead formulae of 
church party into dead performances of dead work or dead attempt to dead praises. That's pretty good, isn't it? They're all your rhythm. But if he lived today, I wonder how many more rhythms he would have had. I'm not going to be so unkind as to give you the extended list. But think, think the idol. This thing which has become defined as an ism, and that, and that, and that. Sometimes it is a distinct error. We could mention the error. Sometimes it is a mixture of truth and error. Sometimes it is truth itself which has become an ism. Yes, the truth. Quite right, it's New Testament, but it's become an ism. And what is the effect of an ism? What do we mean by an ism? Well, that thing has had a fence drawn round it and has in itself become the beginning and the end of everything. And that sense says, unless you toe this line, accept this ground, come on to this ground, there's no fellowship with you. Fellowship is not possible. Only if you accept this interpretation or this experience or whatever it is, that you can put in the place of circumcision, except ye be circumcised, ye cannot be saved. Remember that? A thing might be right in itself, but it has been crystallized into a finality. And the wall door of exclusivism has been set up that unless you come on to this line, you are excluded. And that, as Dr. Farrer, to whom I've just referred, and given, of whom I've given the quotation, that, that is what he meant by the subtlety of the devil. You realize, dear friends, that God has never done a new thing in Christian history, brought forth something that was intended to lead his people further on to that ultimate fullness. But what? Sooner or later, and usually sooner, men have fastened upon that a maidenism of it, crystallized it into a teaching, a manner of practice in Christianity with its own laws and ways and rights, and that thing has brought a rest to the fullness God intended things have almost stopped there. AI after Jericho. One of the most pernicious things that the devil has ever done in Christian history has been to make men crystallize living truth into dead form. And you know he's clever is clever. Paul took the two-edged sword of that Goliath of Judaism and cut off his head and robbed the devil of his most potent instrument 
in the days of Paul. It was Judaism everywhere. Everywhere that the apostle went, that was either waiting for him or on his trail to discredit, to bring in the arrest of spiritual life and progress, continuous back, lost his headed up to this Galatian situation. And with this Galatian letter or what Paul did as here recorded, that Goliath of Judaism was slain for the time being. It didn't lift its head again. At that time, the devil lost a great instinct, a very serviceable means when he lost Judaism. But do you think he takes that line down? Well, I have I have quoted from Parrot Twelveism. And I have said we can add many more. And the Lord Jesus said, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, it wanders, wanders in empty places. If something better and other does not take its place in that man, in that house, and it comes and looks in through the window, comes back from his wanderings and looks as a specter through the window and sees the house is empty. He goes off and brings seven others worse than himself. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. And then the devil lost Judaism. He looked to see what was going to take its place. And because of this vacancy in Christianity, this not going on to sonship, he's brought back the cause of others worse than himself. Theism, theism, theism. Now, I'm not trying to be either humorous or just making up something pass on to you. Dear friends, make no mistake about it. There are very fascinating and attractive isms. New Testament isms and non New Testament issues isms. And in a somewhat extended life and ministry again and again I have seen dear people of God who were out in the open going on with the law in the liberty of the spirit with great promise and then they've been caught in some ism you simply are helpless they steep themselves in the tenets of that ism day and again I've seen it tragedy, British Israelism, whether it's right or wrong, it's a sidetrack. It's something with a fence round it. And you can't get anywhere with those people beyond that thing. That's the obsession. And I take it as an illustration of what I mean. Many others. There's a, there's a great ism sweeping right over America. And over Europe, in these last years, I think I, I can dare to mention this one, well, I'm going to it anyway. Universalism. It's an ism which has captured multitudes, and you just can't get anywhere with these people once they've got it. But I have known them all so promising, so promising. And then this thing is subtly along their way, attractive and fascinating, so appealing, everybody, ultimately, including the devil himself, will be saved. What are you going to do there? Willy-nilly, 
shall be saved. And the cutting in so many of the very vitals of the gospel. I'm illustrating. I'm not just making a text. I'm, I'm trying to show what I mean. But you, you may call these things brass errors. But there are things that are not such errors. Not such errors. Indeed, in themselves they're quite true. But they have become the beginning of all and the end of all for the people who have taken them on. You can get no further. No further. They have lost the great ground, the vast ground of God's full purpose for this dispensation and become stuck on something that is only partial. Arrested like Judaism. Come to a standstill or going round and round in a circle, the circle of this particular thing. It should be a warning to us because you see, this is the thing that has been the enemy of the fullness of Christ all through the centuries. This talk of Lord does something, it's right. The Lord does it. And before long, it is crystallized into a system governed by men. And unless we come that way, you're out. You're not accepted. No penalty. You must stand on this ground. This ground. Or you are not included at all in the whole compass of things. You understand what I mean? Isn't this true? Oh, how subtle this is. Now to come now to this letter again. You notice that there's a transition in this letter. A transition which is gathered under several words or names. They all mean the same thing, whether it is bondage on the one side and liberty on the other. Servant and son. The law and the spirit. This is the issue. The issue in this letter. What does it amount to? What I have been saying, on the one side, the servant, speaking of bondage, limitation, and what word really explains the servant? In the Greek, it's the bond slave. The bond slave. What is it? You must. Servant, you see, has no rights of his own, no liberty. He has to do what he is told. You must. And you must not. You cannot follow your own judgment. You've got to obey this, whatever it is. We call it legalism. There are so many forms. It's the must life. The must life of the slave, the bond servant. That's the word. On the other side, over again, the slave is the son. You know as well as I do what a difference there is between those two. I don't know how it is here in America, but I know how it is over our way. Servant goes out in the morning, be he the builder or the road worker or whatever he is, the employee, and he doesn't hurry to work at all. He goes as slowly as he possibly can without actually making a breach of the law. And 
when he gets there, he takes so long to get his coat off, and then so long to get his clothes out, and then he looks around, and now it's time to have a cup of coffee. And uh, you can go along almost any hour of the day and find him having his, his cup of tea with us, you know, having something. And uh, there are five men working on that road job, and one is doing a bit of tinkling the job the others are all looking on. And then you come along and say, Governor, what's the time? Oh, five minutes to twelve. On with the coat, pack up, go off, meal, you see. And so they go through the day. They're the, the servants, the must people. And there's little of that as well. But when you get the sun, the sun of them, the owner of the property, the sun of the master builder, none of that. No, this thing is a matter of both interest and responsibility and more of love for the father. And he'll work beyond the appointed hour. And he'll work. He'll work all the hours. No must with him. Nothing like that. What is it? It's his spirit. It's the spirit. Carried on by another spirit than the spirit of the servant. That's the letter to the Galatians, you see. Sonship. Liberty from all this demand, essential, obligation. The must. That never comes in. Never comes in at all. The liberty of sonship goes on without considering personal interest without asking any questions as to how much must I, how much can I not. You see the difference? And we are all in peril of some kind of must and drive, even in the things that the Lord has done with us. Blessed things that the Lord has done if we are not very careful, we will bring them into a systematized form and they will become our prison. And it will be the bond slave. Sonship is God's goal for the Christian. God's goal, you know the word is, the manifestation of the sons of God, that's the confirmation of everything. Bringing many sons to God's glory. God dealeth with us as with sons. Sonship, there's no higher thought in all revelation than the thought of sonship. Love is now our we sons of God. It is not yet revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall see him as, as he is. That sonship finally consummated and we are being dealt with on that principle of sonship. Sonship. Wonderful conception. Apostle John, you see, the old man John, in his pathless exile, contemplating his long life, yes, suffering and plenty of it, his long life, our union with his master, he just does right. There's nothing to compare with this, says he, sonship, sonship. Highest thing 
ever thought of by God for us, for redemption. And we're in progress of this. And if that is true, will the devil stop at anything to prevent us getting this to that? Why? You see, it's going to be this corporate sonship glorified in union with the Son who is going to dispose the whole kingdom of Satan, displace it, and take its place for the government in the ages to come. And the prince of this world is not taking that easily. And so not only will he bring these persecutions and suffering from the outside that you'll bring these subtle snares of an ism. Rest our spiritual progress and shut us up to something smaller than God intended. And he's frustrated the end and he's done that. Oh, the point is keep out in the open with the Lord. Keep out in the life of the Spirit. The Spirit will not let you go wrong. Spirit will make known to you all that is intended for you, but don't begin to say to other people when you've got that experience or that light now, unless you accept this and take this ground. You see, you're, you're outside the pale. We are the people. We are the people. Truth begins and ends with us. Oh, God save us from the Hear it of it. Hear it of it. For you to go and think about the ism. Whether denominations are right or wrong, I'm not going to argue, but I will say emphatically, denominationalism is wrong. And it becomes an ism. Something that binds you, controls you, sets the bounds for you then it's wrong. And whatever other thing it may be, whether it is right or wrong, as soon as the enemy succeeds in making that the limit, however good, he defeated the end, there will be an arrest and a reverse. And I can only now take you back and close by reminding you of how Joshua handled the situation. Yes, he sifted this thing down at AI, sifted it down, 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 to tribe, the family, the unit in the family. Achan, Achan, come out. One man with a little brought an arrest, not only to himself, but to the Lord's people. They then stood aside. And they stoned Achan. And it was a very drastic thing that was done because of the principle involved, you see. The principle involved. But Whatever Joshua did with Achan, I don't think it compares to what Paul did with Judaism in Galatia. Listen, if anyone be he an angel from a heaven, which is any other gospel than that which we preach, let him be accursed. The curse was pronounced upon Achan and he died under. Let him be a curse. And I say again, I say again, I repeat it, says Paul, let him be an anathema, let him be a curse. It was the curse upon except of any kind of legalism. Except he did circumcise, he cannot be saved. Except, except, oh, be careful of these except. There are other kinds of accepts which are quite all right. Except a man be born from above, he cannot. 
see the kingdom of God. That's all right. But not a Judaistic one. You see, you have house palm, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God is upon this matter of keeping out in the open with the Lord as your government. The Holy Spirit as your control, your teacher. And it is faith. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit really is law, there's liberty, but it's faith. Faith. Remember again what John said about this. Ye have an anointing. And the anointing which you have received abideth in you. And you need not that anyone teach you anything. The anointing teacheth you all things. Oh, be careful. Be careful. I'm quite independent. I don't need anybody to tell me anything. That is not what John is saying at all. At all. What is John saying? There are many antichrists in the world. There are many antichrists in the world. And an antichrist is not a curious, fearful creature, you know, with a tail and a pitchfork. And, you know, an antichrist is something that assumes the place of Christ. The devil himself is transformed into an angel of light. There are many and with the natural judgment, natural power, you're not able to distinguish between the true and the false, the Christ and the Antichrist. Seem to be so much alike. You, you can't discern, but the anointing will tell you. The anointing which you have received when you come into touch with something for will, if the anointing is really governing, say, be careful. Not in words, but inside. You have feeling there's something not quite clear here, not transparent here, not safe here. I don't feel happy about this. I can't tell you why, but I just don't feel quite happy about this. There's, there's something in me that says, beware. The anointing will teach you it's perfectly safe when the anointing is in charge. You see. And here you are. Here's your other humanity, isn't it? The spiritual man, says Paul, discern it all. And I, I would close with just saying this, dear friend, that in my judgment, the greatest need in Christianity and among Christians today is spiritual discernment. I could not say anything beyond that. I convinced that in a day like this of deceptions and misleadings and all that the great need is our spiritual discernment of knowing the Holy Spirit in this way if he's able to warn you just to warn you not in words might be by words of scripture, but in your own spirit where he dwells, he says, that's all right, go on. The arbitrator is life and peace. But he will say, no, be careful. There's danger there. And then it is for us in our spiritual sensitiveness Take note of that, and let me tell you that it's not my experience that the Holy Spirit speaks with a shout. I've very rarely known the Holy Spirit to speak out in a way that there's no mistaking it. It's been such a gentle thing. Such a gentle thing, just something that I could miss if I didn't fall and learn that the voice of gentle stillness is so often the voice of the Spirit. 
that is sunset, you see, glowing to discern, to sense, to understand. Spirit of sunset. And I've said enough. May the Lord help us to understand and if you are praying, and all your praying, whatever you are praying, ask the Lord that by the Holy Spirit He will develop in you spirit of discernment. Give you spiritual discernment so that you, Paul put it in another place, can discriminate the things which are excellent. Remember that? There's a difference in things good, bad, indifferent, best, excellent. You may be able to discern the things which differ. The original is things which are excellent. The Lord made us people like that. Our Lord may not have been very much entertainment or fascination or attractiveness about all this but we know that thou would be very faithful with us and we want thee to do it and if warning and enlightenment as to peril is thy mercy thy grace and thy goodness and we'll be very grateful if tonight a warning light being shown something to save us oh Lord how we want to go on and go through and come out into the ultimate consummation sons in glory never arrested never having our past shortened never Broad short, O oh Lord, we want to go on to full growth to all that Thou hast called us unto. Now give us understanding, interpret to us Thy meaning, and what we trust has been Thy word. Guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus, and may grace and mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us evermore. Amen.